been teaching for uh, many, many years, around about uh, 18 years, and uh, I'm a chemistry teacher by, spe uh, uh, by specialism. And uh, one of the things, basically, what's happened is that uh, my A-level students have uh, started revising. And it's just, uh, just one of those things where I'd like to, rather than just help people on a one-to-one -one basis, I want to try and distribute, uh, distribute the knowledge um, and uh, allow them to um, study as, 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 as and when they uh, are available to. So, um, so it's, it's all a little bit tentative. I've just kind of rushed this this morning, uh, and I hope uh, it is actually something that you find useful. So what we're going to go through is we're going to go through the OCR paper. Um, that's the A-level paper from 2000, uh, 2015. It's actually the latest paper because what we have at the moment is we have a situation where we have the new A-levels coming through, and um, I'm not entirely sure as to what, what is going to be uh, coming up in, in terms of um, uh, the style of questions. We've got a specimen paper, but a lot of people have the specimen papers. So we have to go back. We have to really wait until um, uh, until we get a huge bank of uh, new A-level uh, papers. But what we can do is we can look back at the uh, the pre-2016 uh, papers, um, uh, entry papers, and we can actually you know use that as a, as a starting point. So um, it's from the same exam board, and just from a chemistry teacher's point of view, it, you know, just 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 as an expert, we can see that there are lots and lots of overlap with what, what candidates have to do right now and what candidates uh, had to do, particularly with this with some of the simplements. So we're just going to go into it. What I'm going to do is uh, you'll notice on the left-hand side we've got um, we've got two windows. We've got one which is uh, the actual uh, paper itself and then underneath we've actually got the, uh, the mark scheme as well. So we're going to be going through that at the same time. So without further ado, try and get this done as quick as possible uh, because we know that your time is really, really useful. Uh, and limited. Uh, we've got the data sheet. We're going to assume that you um, you have access to the data sheet. Uh, I will be putting it in the uh, in the comments section underneath, so you'll be able to uh, just quickly click and and find out what that is. Uh, what if we need the the data sheet? Uh, I can uh, I can I can get it up as well. So all right, okay. So uh, the first question is about the elements with atomic numbers between fifty eight and seventy. Cerium is a metal. So a lot of the candidates will just go straight into it's a very GCSE-S type question. Uh, the relative charge um, would be plus one. You can actually ask this to a, an, an a, a GCSE student. And they'll understand it. Neutron is nil or zero. That will be fine. And then electron minus one. So nice, easy start. Nice, easy entrance to um, uh, uh, the paper. Everyone um, actually secured uh, at least one of the two marks that were available. Um, maybe uh, the mass of the subatomic particles rather than the charge would be um, the, 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 the problem uh, with this question. But you've got a uh, number of particles present in a 140 CE2 plus I, uh, ion. Obviously, you, you must try and use the uh, the fact that you've got the atomic number 58 there. Don't look it up. Don't waste your time. It's already given to you. Um, that, that, will, that will satisfy the proton one. And just look over here. You've got the 2 plus there. So with the 2 plus, you've got uh, two less electrons. So the answer is 56 there. 82 would be uh, the 58 from the 140. So nice two markers just to get you straight into it. Uh, you actually get one mark per column, uh, but what you must do is you must not just put a plus or a minus without a one in any of these columns. Uh, don't don't have uh, your one without charge. So if you just put a one, not good enough, I'm afraid, and certainly not at A level. Um, and what they need to do is they need to also ignore the dashes for relative charge of neutrons. So everyone pretty much got that right. Okay, uh, the next one uh, identify the second product. Now it's a typical acid plus metal. Obviously, pushing uh, pushing the limits in terms of uh, GCSE, um, but the top candidates should be able to um, uh, identify that from their GCSE knowledge as well. H two is allowed hydrogen, but don't put H as a symbol because um, that is actually ignored. Write the formula of, of cerium uh, three sulfate. Uh, so it's a three plus. You've got to remember that the sulfate, from your own knowledge, is SO42 minus. So swap the ion charges around, and you've got CE2 open bracket SO43. Um, the explanation: uh, What has happened to the cerium in this reaction in terms of the number of electrons transferred? You've obviously got um, uh, two seconds here. Just pause this. So we're just getting a little bit of interference. Two seconds there. Um, 
you've obviously got the um, uh, CE2 uh, SO43. Uh, the cerium actually loses three electrons to form the three uh, plus ion. Uh, make sure that you're very, very succinct with that. Make sure that you are actually expressing it in the way that, that you should be. Um, SE3+, plus. Uh, just having a look, have we missed anything? What happens to the cerium in this reaction in terms of number of electrons transfer? Just make sure that you're starting off with the cerium and you're explaining that it is three electrons from the outside. How has the salt been formed in this reaction? Well, essentially what's happened is uh, the hydrogen ion of an acid... Hello! Are oh, you seeing me there? <laughs> Students should be revising. Go and revise. Uh, how has the salt been formed in this reaction? Well, basically what's happened is that the hydrogen ion has been replaced by the metal ion. So pretty straightforward. Uh, basically what's happened is that you've got a redox reaction and the H plus has now gained an electron uh, from each of the, um, uh, well, three, let's put it this way, three hydrogen uh, H plus ions would, would gain electrons each individually uh, from a uh, cerium and uh, the cerium would then, with those, with those three uh, electrons lost, then become uh, a CE3 plus. There you go. Right. So, you would have got to this stage and you're thinking, gosh, when are they actually going to be asking me um, about a question uh, regarding an element that we, that we have already covered? And that's just one of, the, one of the things that you just have to be expecting when it comes to uh, A-level. Um, the top candidates will be able to apply this knowledge with all of the, um, all of the knowledge that they know uh, already uh, 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 and apply it to uh, elements that uh, they've never even met before. So don't worry and panic if you actually do come across uh, questions like this. Just make sure that you can hold your own. Um, right, okay. So having said that, this is potentially a difficult calculation that is coming up. Um, but you'd be, you'd be pleased to know that once, you know, if, you, if you're just uh, resilient through it, you will actually secure all of the marks that, uh, that, that are in here. So it's a calculation of the volume of oxygen. As soon as you think about volume of oxygen, you're thinking Avogadro, you're thinking 24,000 uh, centimetres cubed is equal to a mole. So what you have to do is you have to try and figure out how many moles of uh, europium you've got. Remember, you've got atomic number 63 there. That might actually help. So all you'll need to do is you'll need to look up the um, the uh, relative atomic mass of uranium, uh, europium rather. Uh, it's 152.0. That's straight on the data sheet. And then all you'll need to do is number of moles equals mass over molar mass. Uh, so the, uh, the so the mass that you actually have is 0 0.06 moles. Um, and then straight after that what you would then need to do is you'd need to calculate the amount of uh, oxygen that's coming out. Now remember that the, for every four moles of Europe, uh, europium, you've got three moles of oxygen. Don't get put off by that, um, by that little uh, two over there. By any means, all you need to do is just work out in terms of the number of moles that you have. So it's 0 0.06 times, uh, times three divided by four. Obviously, for every... Uh, three moles of oxygen, you've got four, so divide it by four first and then not times it by three. You've got 0 0.045 moles that comes through and then you need to scale it up. So multiply that by 24,000, you've got 1,080 centimetres cubed, which is uh, a standard, standard calculation use of Avogadro. So you've got part D. Now this is empirical formula, so you should have your card index systems ready and you should have um, a list on one side where you've got uh, um, empirical formulas to flip over the card and you've got the, the definition. So it is so. what's critical is knowing that it is the simplest whole number ratio of atoms of each element present in the compound. Okay. Now you need to determine the empirical formula of the compound. So empirical formula, get the stuff that you have, divide it by the atomic, uh, the relative atomic masses. So you've got your, uh, your uh, uh, number of moles and then compare the number of moles with each other. All you'll need to do is you'll just need to divide through by the uh, smallest one. Um, so all you'll need to do, I believe, is 1.9, um, then which is pretty much two. You got four point. Uh, we, you may not even have to divide it all the way through, but you've got roughly two moles of the uh, the, the first one, which is oxygen. You've got 0 0.5, which is the sulfur, and then you've got the TM, which is 0 0.31. Why don't we just multiply it all through? Uh, so 0 0.3, uh, 0.319. Those are the molar ratios, and then you should work it out to be O12S3TM2. So go for that. 
Um, just having a quick look through, and uh, if you divide that by 3.19 and then divide that by 3.19, you might be able to get something a little more sensible, resembling 012 S3 TM2. Okay, so have a look through that calculation. Make sure that you are able to do it, and. Uh, um, don't uh, don't try and uh, mess about with the order in which the elements are there. Stick to the order that's given. Okay, oxygen, sulfur, T, uh, and thulium. Topic number sixty-nine. Okay, right. Let's move on. Ytterbium. Now, this is again. You know, this is the last part of the um, the actual. Um, uh, question, so almost there. Atomic number 70, first element in the periodic table to have the first four shells full. State the number of electrons in the fourth shell. Okay, so what you've got to do is you've got to remember, right, okay, what, what's, uh, what, now it's atomic number uh, 70, so how many go in the first period, how many in that first shell, if you want to think about it, it's just two, then you've got eight, and then you've got 18, so use your periodic table, two plus eight plus 18, add them all up together, and then you've got um, 32 remaining, there you go, see, it's a very, very easy one, that one. Uh, state the number of electrons in the fourth shell, so it should be 32. Um, how many orbitals are there in the, Sorry, in the fourth shell. Uh, how many orbitals are there in the third shell? Uh, so you've got um, you, you've got to think right. Okay, so you've got the third shell. You've got S, P, and D orbitals. So you've got one S, then you've got three P, and then you've got five uh, D. One plus three plus uh, one plus three plus five equals nine. There you go. Easy. So how did candidates do on uh, on the real method uh, on the real uh, actual exam? Well. Um, for 1E part 1, uh, although there's a clear statement in spec that candidates should know the number of electrons in the first four shells, many are uncertain about how many electrons will be found in a complete fourth shell. Okay, so make sure you know that. Uh, and 1E part 2, uh, slightly more demanding, believe it or not, than part 1, range of answers, but 3 was not an uncommon uh, response, presuming you're arriving, uh, arising from a confusion between the number of orbitals and the number of subshells or different types of orbitals. So make sure that you try uh, your best and make sure that you get that one right. Okay, how are we doing so far? Are we ready for number two? Let's go for number two. Let's go straight into it. So, about group three. Okay, moving on. And uh, this one just seems to be all about structure and bonding. Aluminium combines directly with fluorine. Okay, easy as pie. You've got fluorine goes to fluoride. Aluminium plus fluorine reacts to form aluminium fluoride. Now, it does say uh, it's an equation. So if they're giving an equation, um, you, you do have um, uh, a chance to show off the all capabilities of balancing. It says write the equation. They're looking for uh, a, a balanced chemical equation. So you've got 2Al, remember that, fluorine is diatomic, and you've got 2AlF3, okay? You've got, you've got the ability to uh, do multiples. Just make sure that you're not wasting your time trying to figure out state symbols, just go straight into it. It's a one marker, okay? Uh, part B, solid, uh, aluminium fluoride, giant ionic structure. So you've got regular, repeating pattern, a lattice, alternating. Um, you've got positive and negative ions that are sitting, situated next to each other. Allow oppositely charged ions from a label diagram. Why not put a diagram? Just start off with a quick sketch, three by three by three. Go straight into it. Two marks, very, very easy. Especially if you label it. If there's something wrong with your actual definition, uh, then uh, you can just... Uh, um, get the marks and secure the marks that way. Right, okay, I'm just going to zoom in on the answer for this diagram. So we actually got a diagram here. So outer electrons only, that's all you'll need to do. Okay, so you can see that you've got the uh, the AL uh, just with a full shell. Uh, it's the it's the, the one that's, that's in, so it had three electrons on the outside, and you've got those three electrons that are joining each of the fluorines to form the fluorides. Notice that you've got the dots and the crosses, make sure that that's done, okay? Don't waste your time with inner, um, uh, inner, inner electrons, okay? Right, so, the two, so also finally make sure that you've got the correct charges on there, it's three plus and you've got the minus, uh, so don't, don't miss that out, okay? Right, the next question talks about something completely different, you've got covalent bond, co-share electrons, pair of electrons, so sharing an outer pair of electrons, basically, that's the answer for that one, dot, dot cross diagram, make sure that you're not drawing it in the same way as you would actually have um, 
uh, an ionic uh, compound, all right? Then notice that there are little hints. You say boron tribromide molecule, obviously not an ionic compound, so outer electrons only. There you go. Don't waste your time with circles as well. It's just a simple one marker. That's all you need to do. Right, okay, next question. Appropriate uh, technical terms question. you got following substances conduct electricity when solid or molten. Explain your answers in terms of the particles uh, provided. Right, you've got metallic bonding there. You've got ionic bonding there. And you've got covalent bonding. There. So you've got maybe simple uh, simple covalent there. You've got ionic, so obviously conducts in, so uh, conducts in uh, molten. You have to heat it, you have to melt it doesn't conduct when it's a solid. Aluminium, you've got free C of electrons around the positive ions, and the ions are in a, a nice regular arrangement. Okay, so um, looking back at the question, you've also got uh, whether it conducts electricity when solid or molten, so why not just break it down into aluminium, aluminium fluoride, bor boron tribromide, and just have like solid, molten, and just have a quick explanation, spend 30 seconds on that, draw up a very, very quick table just in the space that's right next to it, and then make sure that you you have all of the points so covering all of the points will make sure uh, that you you definitely definitely hit all of the marks so aluminium obviously conducts when molten obviously when con conducts when uh, solid the reason you've got to talk about those delocalized de electrons you can draw it if you want to just label it that's absolutely fine uh, but just make sure that you show and label the delocalized electrons. And moving on to the aluminium fluoride, mobile ions. Make sure you're talking about mobile ions. Don't don't start talking about mobile atoms. Don't start talking about mobile electrons. Okay, very very clear point there. And make sure you also say that you 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 can't have mobile ions when when it's a solid, right? And then last one, boron tri, uh, boron. Yeah, that's fine. Uh, the ions are fixed in the aluminium fluoride. Boron tribromide, uh, you've got the fifth mark for, uh, doesn't conduct in solid and molten states. Uh, there's no mobile electrons, there's no mobile ions, uh, no mobile charge carriers, that's a really powerful phrase to use. No mobile charge particles, that's absolutely fine. Remember, mobile, able to move, okay? And it's a nice five marker question there, that one. Okay, aluminium is 13 successive ionization energies. So remember, it's a 2, 8, and 3. So the third ionization energy, think about, think about that. It is, when you talk about X ionization energy, you are talking about forming X as a product. So if it's a third ionization energy, you're talking about the aluminium ion with three electrons that have been taken off, forming Al3+. So Al2 plus reacts to form Al3 plus. Remember as well, you've got the definition. Of, by definition, you actually have to have um, gaseous atoms forming gaseous ions, and you've got the electron in there as well. Okay. Now the state symbols in terms of ionization energy are critical because of because of the uh, definition. Okay, right. So it says on the axes below. Add, um, add crosses to show the 13 successive ones. Now remember, you've got uh, 2, 8, 3, so the first one's going to be easiest to peel off. Then you've got a series where you have a 3 coming off, and then another 3 coming off, uh, so it's got a little crossover there. And then uh, you've got 2, which are harder to take off, that's the 2S, and then you've got the 1S, which are even even harder. So you've got... Um, You've got 13 ionization energies. General, generally, you should have an increase because it's going close and close. So you're, you're taking away all of the electrons. You've got um, you, you're, if what you've got to do is you've got to think right. If you're successively taking off electrons, you are trying to remove an electron from something that is becoming more and more positive. So obviously, it's trying to the nuclear attraction is really, really dragging it in more and more. Let's say, for example, if you do succeed in taking off a fifth, um, a fifth electron during the fifth ionization energy and what's actually happening you are leaving behind a four plus ion uh, compared to uh, like the eighth ionization energy you're trying to pull it away from uh, the seven plus to make it an eight plus it's really really tougher so you should have that nice clear trend going upward so that's the first part the two largest increases are between the third and fourth and the 11th and 12th because you're breaking from the third shell into the second shell much much closer and then the second shell into the first shell obviously nuclear attraction just increases especially when you break the shell so there you go easy as pie all right two marks there um right 
Okay, now third question is talking about chlorine in group 7. So you've got an easy one here. Minus 1 oxidation state uh, goes to 0 because you've got to remember that it's elements. And then reduce down, you've got the Mn, Mn2+, plus that stays the way it is. You've got the H, that stays the way it is as well. The H plus stays the way it is. Uh, what else have we got over here? I'm just looking at it. All oh, right, actually, do you know what? Have a look again. So it's really easy for us to think that the MN stays the same, but in actual fact, that's a 4 plus. Okay, that's a 2 plus. So it is actually gaining two electrons. So two chlorine, two chloride ions will lose two electrons to form a chlorine gas, and those two electrons will be provided to the MN4 plus to turn into the MN2 plus. That's your MN being reduced from MN4 plus to MN2 plus. Uh, MN4 plus to MN2 plus. The oxidation numbers in terms of that is minus one to zero for the chlorine and uh, plus four to plus two of the manganese. Okay, all right. Very very tricky. If you don't if you don't make your uh, answer really really clear and uh, and if you just try and go into sentences for it, it's not. It, it, you, know, you could you could get quite tongue tied. Right. Okay. The next answer. Uh, manganese atom. Okay, so the manganese, any clues in the question? Uh, no, so you, what you'd have to do is you'd have to look up the manganese. Uh, let's, uh, let's see what the answer is just over here. So you've got 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6, 3d5, 4s2. Now remember that the 3d5 has actually been written there, and the reason why is because it's in order of um, uh, the the outer shell location. So it's got one, two, three, four, four outer, uh, four shells, uh, and it's the fifth one along. Now they will allow 4s2, 3d5 um, in the old scheme. Um, ignore 1s2 seen twice, if, just in case you've written that mistake over there. Absolutely fine. Uh, I would stick with uh, this format, okay? So, uh, going on to the next one, chlorine gas um, can be added to a cold dilute alkaline solution to form bleach. So you've got the equation. So chlorine, this is a standard chlorine question uh, when you study group uh, group seven. So you should know uh, should know this by now. Uh, let's just magnify it if I can do it quite quick. I'm not quite sure where the plus sign is. So let's have a look. He says, hoping to blow it up a little further. Let's see, make sure that that's coming up. There you go. So. I hope you can see that. So you start off with your reactants, chlorine, and then you've got uh, uh, sodium, uh, sodium hydroxide, and that is bubbling through uh, to form bleach. That's sodium hypochlorite. There you go. So NaClO. Uh, don't get confused by that. Don't think, oh, it's an iodine. You've got sodium chloride, and then you've got H2O, and that's absolutely fine. So you can go with that. Um, so chlorine gas through potassium iodide. So you've got uh, displacement reaction. The more reactive will displace the least reactive halogen from its compound. So you should start to see that iodine forming and it will turn yellow or orange or brown. That's absolutely fine, depending on how concentrated your uh, iodide was in the potassium iodide solution. Uh, you've got the ionic equation for this. So there's your chlorine gas forms a chloride, it's a simple redox reaction. You've got iodides forming iodine. Make sure you've got two iodides there to balance out the iodine. Okay? Now, Let's see if you can do this. The ability of an atom to attract electrons. I wonder what that's asking. What is it asking? Perhaps it's to do with electronegativity. So let's just scroll in the next one. There we go. All right. So even without looking at the question itself, you should be able to... Maybe that's, that's actually quite a nice tool to do right in the last four or three weeks when you're going through your past papers. Look at the answers first. Can you try and maybe see what the answers are and then uh, figure out what the question is from that? So there you go. Draw a 3D diagram of a molecule. Uh, use partial changes, uh, charges to include polypores. I think I've missed a question over here. Uh, electron pair. So this ability to attract electrons, that's absolutely fine. And make sure that you're talking about the attraction of electrons into uh, in, in a bond towards a nucleus. Okay, right, 3D diagram of CH2Cl2. Uh, so it depends on how good a drawer you are. Should look like that. Use partial charges to indicate polar bonds. So you've got the pl delta plus there, very, very strong delta minus there, very strong delta minus there. Now, the question you might be asking is why, why not put um, any delta uh, deltas on the hydrogen. That'd be a good question to have. Let's see if uh, 
if if uh, the example say anything about it, they just say they're going to ignore it. So you could do it, but the most important thing to have on there really is is the the CL because that's that's a huge uh, difference in electronegativity. Okay, so just a quick reminder of how to draw the wedges. Okay, so bond in the plane of the paper, that's absolutely fine, solid line, bond out a plane, uh, so that's a solid wedge, there's a triangle there, right, they do allow a lot of different uh, different types that go actually go into the paper, so you can choose that, I, I would use that for a hydrogen bond really, I'd probably use that one, but uh, it's, in, it's quite interesting that they will actually allow different types, so go with what you're comfortable with, okay. Any three E3D representation with a minimum of one bond into the plane of the paper and a minimum of uh, one out of the paper. Okay, so get that right. Easy, two marks straight there. Okay, right. Why is it polar? Well, the reason why it's just primarily because it's uh, it's non-symmetrical. You can actually model this using Play-Doh and using toothpicks. So hey, all A-level students, I would advise you get some Play-Doh. Get <laughs> have it from little brother or sister. Just borrow it. Uh, give it back, obviously give it back, get some uh, toothpicks and then just stick them all together and you can actually make your own uh, chiral molecules, you can actually see uh, what is actually going on in there, so it's because it's non-symmetrical, it's not flat or anything like that, they don't cancel each other and they're asking you about that. Okay, bromine's got two isotopes, a real easy one there. Uh, calculate the percentage of Br79 atoms, now you can actually just look at it really, but the answer is 55 there. Okay, any hints and tips on that? Uh, relative atomic mass, 79.9. Calculate the percentage of Br79 atoms in the sample of bromine. So if it is 70, uh, 79.9, it's got to be closer towards the Br79, closer than uh, the, uh, the 81. Okay, so just do that. Now, how would you work out the relative atomic mass of something? Well, what, we, what you could do is you could actually say... Uh, let the percentage of one of them be x, and then the percentage of the other one is 100 minus x. So if you worked it out that way and just used a little bit of algebra, you could actually then work it out that way. You can just express it in terms of x, rearrange the calculation, rearrange the equation, and hey presto, you've actually got it. So a lot of people may find that, to, that that's much easier if you just consider it as being x, okay? Right, okay, we're going to move on uh, straight into it, straight into number four. We're halfway there. So uh, this is a titration question. Um, straight into it, let's have a look. Calculate the amount in moles of uh, sulfuric acid used to neutralize only uh, the sodium hydroxide. So you've got the volume in centimeters cubed. Convert that into decimeters, divide it by 1,000, multiply by the um, uh, molarity, the count, concentration, 0.1, and that's your answer, 1.8 times 10 to the minus 3 moles. Uh, the next question after that, so you'll notice it's step by step, calculate the concentration, so you look at the, um, you look at it and you look at the ratio, so obviously two moles of the uh, sodium hydroxide will react for every one mole of sul sulfuric acid, take that into account, okay, so the number of moles is two times whatever you had before, and then you've got, uh, so it's a 1.8 .8 times two, and then multiply it by a uh, thousand, and then divide it by twenty-five, and you've got your you've got your ratio there, zero point one four four. Where did we get the thousand from? Where did we get the twenty-five? Let's have a look. It's a twenty-five centimeters cubed sample, and remember that you earlier in the question, uh, you've got uh, two hundred centimeters cubed, twenty-five. So your twenty-five is there, and you multiply it back up to a thousand because you're converting it back from decimeters per decimeters cubed back to moles. Okay. Right. So the calculation is there in in the in the mark scheme. Just have a go at it. Try and calculate yourself. So, B part two. Let's just have a quick look. Just make sure I'm not skipping over anything whatsoever. Uh, B part two. Check the answer. Right. Okay. B part one. I think I don't want to skip past that one. There we go. Just losing track of it. Okay. Calculate the amount in moles of sodium hydroxide. Let's have a look at the um, have a look at the an uh, the actual information that they give you right over here. You've got sodium hydroxide. So two moles of sodium hydro hydrogen carbonate. I should say two moles of sodium hydrogen carbonate plus uh, sulfuric acid reacts to form its products. 
Um, volume of H2SO4 needs to neutralize both, so obviously because it's diprotic, you've got the 29.5. Let's have a look. Looks quite complicated, doesn't it? Calculate the amount in moles of sodium hydroxide in the 200. Now, how do we do that? Right, let's see. So, uh, given 200 centimetres cubed of solution X in which sodium hydroxide and sodium hydrogen carbonate have both been dissolved, you've got the uh, two different titrations and samples of solution X. Um, the student concentrations for the titrations are shown below. So... What you would have to do is, now that you've worked out the actual, um, the actual concentration of your sodium hydroxide and your sodium uh, and your sulfuric acid, you then have a way of um, figuring out how much sodium hydroxide has actually been reacted there. And then all you need to do is you then need to try and take off the, um, the remaining amount of uh, from from the sodium hydrogen carbonate so looks quite hairy but the first thing that you have to do is work out the number of moles that you started off with in the actual titration so sodium hydrogen carbonate 0.1 that's your concentration uh, multiplied by 11.50 now it is 11.50 because you've actually got uh, the 29.5 take away the 18 all right think of it uh, think about it you've actually got both of them uh, together in one of them, and then you've got uh, only only the sodium hydroxide in the second one. Okay, that's what is stated in the actual question paper itself. So go with that, and then what you have to do is uh, work out the number of moles of of that uh, sodium hydrogen carbonate in that 11.50. That should work out to be 0 0.00230 moles. Then what you've got to do is you've got to scale that back up to 200 centimeters cubed that gives you 0.0184 so notice that's around about uh, well you've got around about 10 and then 10 times as big and then just take a little bit off so you've got something that's uh, that's on, that's that's workable something that's a sensible answer and i think that's your answer there so no problem at all okay so calculations can be quite uh, especially when you get to this stage of the paper it can be quite telling and, uh, you know, if you're a candidate and you're going through there, I wouldn't worry about it. If, you, if you're so, suddenly starting to get a little bit fuzzy, skip it. Go to the next question. Come back to it when you've got a fresh mind. Alternatively, some candidates, what they like to do is they like to go straight for the calculation um, and then sort of let that wear themselves down. And then they, start, they, they, they like to go for the, uh, uh, the more wordy questions and then finish up with all the things like the definitions and stuff like that. So, hey-ho, it depends on what your strategy is, but... Uh, choose the right strategy and you should be fine. Uh, let's move on to calcium group two. Uh, reaction of calcium and its compounds. You've actually got uh, both reactions to form calcium oxide. Let's just have a look at this one. So calcium, that's a direct combination over here. So it's calcium with oxygen in the air and calcium carbonate. That's a thermal decomposition reaction, uh, losing um, uh, carbon dioxide. So equation for reaction number one, there's your direct combination and there's your thermal decomposition for the second one. Uh, calcium hydroxide is both a base and an alkali. Explain what is meant by the term base. And an alkali is a soluble base, and the alkali actually releases OH minuses, minus ions into the aqueous uh, solution. Um, base, by definition, is a substance that any, any substance that readily accepts H plus ions. It can accept, you can express it as being the proton acceptor. Remember that you do have uh, insoluble. Uh, insoluble bases as well as soluble bases. The soluble bases are the alkali. So go with that. Let's move quickly on. Uh, so calcium hydroxide, small piece of calcium to a large excess of water. So you'll see fizzing. The calcium will actually sink at the start and then it will start to, 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 to rise again. Uh, if you did actually put some indicator in there, it would actually turn purple. But not asking about that. The observation is that it is fizzing. And the reason why is because uh, the, the, uh, the calcium is actually dissolving in, uh, into the solution. Okay. Um, uh, you've also got calcium plus, uh, plus water, uh, reacts to form calcium hydroxide plus hydrogen, that's the equation. So interestingly, it doesn't actually say give a word equation, it just says give an equation. Whenever they say give an equation, give the actual balanced chemical equation, okay? 
All right, part D. A student prepares a solution of calcium nitrate from calcium carbonate. What reaction, uh, what reagent rather, should the student use? So we're looking at uh, nitric acid makes nitrates, um, sulfuric acid makes sulfates, um, ethanoic mass acid makes ethanoates, um, hydrochloric acid makes chlorides. Okay, so it's all coming back from uh, GCSE. Calcium carbonate is the base. The only other thing that you'd form apart from the metal salt is, is uh, carbon dioxide. There you go, nitric acid, and then balance the equation, making sure that you realize that calcium is a 2 plus, NO3 is a minus, the nitrate, uh, nitrate ion, so it's CaNO3 2. Uh, that's, that's really what they're testing you on. They're testing you on whether you can actually remember the charges on the ions. Okay. Right, I think this is the final question in the paper. Uh, attraction between particles, nuclei and outermost electrons in gaseous item, uh, atoms varies across period three. All right, okay, so basically what they're talking about is they're talking about the increase in effective nuclear charge, okay? You're not talking about um, there is no shielding or anything like that. The attraction between the nuclei and the outermost electrons increases across the period because the nuclear charge is increasing. The number of protons, if you want to express it like that, is increasing. And um, the explanation is that the electrons are being put in, they're being parked into the same shell, um, they are experiencing a, serious, a similar amount of shielding because you've got inner shells that are unaffected, but they are also being drawn in as well. Uh, you've got the same number of shells and the atomic radius is decreasing because you actually have more and more protons. So you just pick one of those points. Uh, the ones that I would pick myself personally is that Nuclear charge is increasing, uh, and um, you actually have um, the atomic radius decreasing. Table below shows uh, boiling points. So you can actually see now hydrogen bonding is as, as soon as I see ammonia, it's straight in there. Um, fluorine, uh, you've got a very, very low boiling point, very small um, uh, attractive forces between there. Bromine, you've actually got now uh, increased electrons because you've got increased number of London forces, those temporary ones. And the ammonia is actually binding uh, together the molecules uh, because of hydrogen bonding. Okay, so that's pretty much a whistle stop tour of uh, the explanations. Am ammonia has hydrogen bonding, F2 and Br2 both have. Now, they used to say van der Waals forces. You can't get away with that now. Uh, because van der Waals forces was actually defined as being a little too vague, so you have to talk about London forces in the new uh, A levels, and then the type of particles marked. Um, forces or attractions are between molecules. Make sure that you're not talking about forces of attraction between ions or anything like that. Um, intermolecular, make sure that you're using those those uh, words really, really correctly. And I think there's one more. The London forces in bromine are greater than in fluorine because there are more electrons. I think I've stated that earlier as well. Okay, you can also start talking about the, uh, the London forces in bromine greater than the hydrogen bonding, and that will be interesting because you're actually comparing now ammonia with fluorine and bromine. Um, you're basically comparing them all, all against each other. So compare ammonia, compare fluorine, and compare bromine. It might be a nice little triangle that you might want to um, uh, have just right at the top of it and just sort of put the, put the intermolecular forces, put the features, and then do in between you could actually have a line, you could actually do the comparison, you can do it sort of sideways and on top of that, would be quite an interesting one. So bromine obviously, boiling point is the most, those, va those London forces are really driving the, uh, the bonding well above um, the, uh, the hydrogen bonding and that is it. So hopefully fingers crossed, you've really enjoyed uh, watching this. And, um, and that was the inaugural one. Uh, please leave any comments that you have uh, in the uh, in the comment section. I know it's uh, you know there's lots and lots of uh, areas in which we can improve, but uh, it's always nice to know that it's helped at least some people. And uh, thanks very much for joining us, and hope you enjoyed the stream.